first reading this morning is found on page 978 in your few Bibles. It's James, third chapter, starting with the third verse through the 13th, and then we'll jump over to the fourth chapter. James 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we could turn the whole animal. Or take a ship, for an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, <coughs> and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by good by deeds done in the, human, in the humanity that comes from wisdom. We'll jump to verse four, chapter four, verse ten. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks God. God. I would ask you now if you would please stand for the psalm, and then we'll say the prayer afterwards. I will read the first verse, if you will respond with the second. On the psalm, Psalm 54, page 459. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Your word, my great God. Listen to my words, my God. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. People without regard for God. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. It is your faithfulness. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, Lord. For it is good. You have delivered me from all my troubles. And my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. Praise be to God. If you will join with me in the prayer of the day, found in your bulletin and up on the screen. Lord Jesus, Satan wanted to be the greatest of all time. He and his followers are classified as the ghosts of Scripture. Help us to see the connection. Help us to see the holy view of the Lord of eternity. And that is never going to change. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. At the council meeting in May, I think it was, the pastor announced that he would not be here on September 22nd. And he asked for some volunteers to conduct the, the sermon this morning, this, or the, the, the service this morning. So I volunteered to do the message. I volunteered Mike to do the, <laughs> the service, Mike, so thank you. Uh, one of my favorite movies is a Western, and it's titled Broken Trails. And in that movie, a cowboy named Robert Duvall, which I'm sure you all know, He's standing over a grave, and one of his cowboy colleagues that were shot and murdered. And he says, from birth to death, we travel between two eternities. From birth to death, we travel between two eternities. 
Now we can do nothing about the eternity up until we were born. But we can be sure we have everything to say about how we spend eternity after we die. So if we compare life to a race, I think we would all understand that it matters a little who's winning at the halfway point of the race. The only thing that counts is who's winning when we cross the finish line. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Uh, so if you would like to follow along, it's, it's in Luke chapter 16. And we're going to talk about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. But first of all, Jesus is on his way. He's on his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem where he's going to be arrested and crucified. And on the way, in our story today, he's talking to the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, and he's talking about the idea that you cannot serve God and money. Okay? You cannot live for the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. It's not compatible. So, verse 13, chapter 16. This is a very familiar verse, I know to all of you. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's all that Jesus said. It's all in red. And then Luke writes, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. So the Pharisees, you know, they're the religious leaders of Israel. And these religious leaders... They have used their power and position to accumulate considerable wealth. And that's why Jesus says, or Luke says, that they were lovers of money. And that gets us to our story today, which starts in verse 19, the rich man and Lazarus. And there's a lot of discussion among Bible scholars whether this is a parable or this is actually an historic account. Okay, if you look through, just look, you got your Bible open, and you look at chapter 15, for, for instance, the, the subtitles, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost son, chapter 16, the parable of the shrewd manager. But this does not designate that this is a parable. So is it an historic account? It's not my purpose to convince you one way or the other this morning, but what's important this morning is the context of what the story is about this morning. Okay, verse 19, chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. So the fact is that this guy, that the rich man was dressed in purple would indicate extreme wealth. The dye, the purple dye was very rare in the days of Jesus. And was very expensive, so only royalty or extremely wealthy people could afford to dress in clothes that were purple. And it says he lived in luxury every day, so he dressed this way every day. This was not his Sunday go to church clothes. This was the way he dressed every day. He dressed, every day he lived in luxury, had a banquet. Everything was good for him every day. Verse twenty-one. Let's see, no, verse 20. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So this is the second character in our story. He's Lazarus, he's a poor man, he's weak, he's lame. He had to be carried to the gate every day of the rich man. Now, this is more information for the rich man. The rich man lived, had a gate, which would indicate he was also extremely wealthy as he lived in, shall we say, a gated community. Okay? So Lazarus every day was laid at his gate, and, and uh, his body is covered with sores, and he stays at the gate because he's hoping for a few scraps of food thrown out by the rich man. Now, when the text says, that, he's, that uh, he's looking for scraps of food from the table. It doesn't mean that Lazarus is laying under the table. Lazarus is laying outside 
by the gate. And uh, at the end of the, the banquet every day, the servants, probably the rich man, they gather up all the scraps and stuff left on the table. He comes garbage, and they throw, they throw it over the table. Let's see, and then he says, uh, even the dogs came and licked the sore. So, so Lazarus is in competition for this suit with dogs. Now the dogs in this period of time were very disease-ridden, they're dingy, they're dirty, they're not pets like we see people have dogs today. So Lazarus was in competition with these dogs for the scraps of food that came, that was dumped over the, over the gate. And then Jesus says, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So why do dogs, dogs lick their own wounds, why? It facilitates healing. So these dogs were showing more compassion to Lazarus than the rich man did. So this kind of sets up the story. We're halfway through the race, and it's obvious that the rich man is winning. But then we get to the finish line, <coughs> verse 22. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So the poor man dies. The text doesn't say that he was buried, that his body was probably just removed and discarded as he was poor. But there's this wonderful statement that says that angels of God met him and carried him to a place of honor. In our Bible, the NIV says it's Abraham's side. Some texts, some translations call it Abraham's bosom. But the thing is, he went to a place of comfort. I call it a place of comfort. It's a place, really, remember Jesus has not been crucified yet, has not resurrected. So this is a place where we are between our physical death and probably our final judgment. And it's a place that, as a believer, we're free from all the darkness of the world. Okay? We are safe. All our elements ailments and all our issues don't exist anymore. Now I also told the rich man died that he was buried. So this probably had a very expensive too. He would have been consistent with a man of extreme wealth and he probably hired many mourners that would be born in the streets for days because of his passing. Okay. But all of a sudden in verse 23, the rich man is going to realize the race is over and he lost. He's not the winner. Verse 23. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So the rich man's in Hades. He's in hell. And he's in torment. And he looks up and he sees Lazarus. He knows him. He recognizes him. He knows him by name. Only now all of a sudden there's been this great reversal. The one who used to be at the gate with such misery is now at the banquet table of Abraham as an honored guest. And the rich man is in misery. Then notice the rich man cries out, Father Abraham. Now this is a very respectable greeting. A very respectful way to address Abraham. He knew Abraham, he recognized him. So it's important to realize the rich man was not an agnostic. He was an atheist. He probably was a religious Jew because he knew the laws. He recognized Abraham. And he was determined, of course, in this life to live the things of the world. But now there's this great reversal. And then he sees Lazarus as beneath him because he cries out, Abraham, send Lazarus. Send Lazarus over here to serve me. So he went from the banquet table. The rich man said, wanting nothing more than one drop of water on my tongue. Because I am, he is, the rich man is in torment. What a reversal. 25, 26. But Abraham replied, Son, 
Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while well, Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been set in place. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So the rich man, in his lifetime, he showed no mercy on those who were in need. But now suddenly he's the one in need. He's crying out to Abraham, please show mercy on me. But Abraham says, son, you need to remember you made your choices. And during life you had good things, but the race is over and you lost. And Lazarus had a miserable time. But that's all, also over. And now he's the winner. And he's seated with Abraham at the banquet table. This is this great reversal. But then Abraham says, he says, you know, even if I wanted to send Lazarus over, I couldn't. Because there is this chasm that separates us. And Jesus says this chasm is fixed. And nobody is going to change sides from one direction to the other. So it's a warning. We better think about and make our decisions now. Because once the race is over, the winners and losers are set. And there's no changing that. And it's worth noting that Jesus is abundantly clear that over time, people in torment don't change their minds and eventually end up across the divide in a place of comfort. That's just the way it is. Verse 27. He answered, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to him. So, the rich man, so what the rich man wants, he wants Abraham to send Lazarus back to his father's house to warn his brothers so they will not end up in this place of torment. So what he's implying by that, if someone had just warned him, the rich man, that he would have made his different decisions. But no, nobody told him. If only someone would have warned him. But the irony of this, that's exactly what Jesus is doing in telling the story. He's warning the Pharisees that while they still have a chance to change their minds, you better listen. Abraham says, no, they don't need Lazarus. They have Moses and the prophets. And of course, these Pharisees were experts in Moses and the law. 30 and 31. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Okay, you can see what's coming here. Shortly after this moment, Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, is going to stop off in Bethany. Okay, he's got Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, you remember? Another Lazarus who had died. Okay, he had been dead for three days. And Mary and Martha asked Jesus if he would, would resurrect him. Of course, when Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead, did they all believe? No. As a matter of fact, John tells us at that moment that the Pharisees determined that both Jesus and Lazarus must die in the Gospel of John. So what's the relevance of the story this morning? First of all, we have to be careful we don't misunderstand what's said here. The point of the story is that all rich people are bad and go to hell. And all poor people are good and go to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. Abraham himself was very wealthy. But the Pharisees, you know, they don't get the message. He's telling the story because they're lovers of money. You can have rich people who love Jesus and live by the kingdom of God. And you can have poor people that live for the things of this world and love money. So it 
blessing has nothing to do with how much money you have. It has everything to do with the issues of the heart. Whether you're living for, whether you're going to live for the things of the world or whether you're going to live for the kingdom of God. Now many of us in this room, when we read this story, we would identify with the poor person. But it's helpful to understand, based on how the rest of the world lives and how we live, probably everybody in this room would be considered one of the rich people. So ultimately, the point of the story is to give thought to what we live for, give thought to what matters, and to be sure that we're clear that the things of this life end at death. It's a reminder that for the unbeliever, the only good they're ever going to know is whatever they can accumulate in this life. The only good they're ever going to have if you're an unbeliever is in this life. Because when you die, as an unbeliever, you're, it's over. And you're going to spend the rest of eternity in torment. For us believers, the only pain, the only suffering, the only struggle, the only despair we will ever know is in this life. And when we die, it's over. And it's over forever. But then we are then in a place of comfort. Abraham's bosom, Abraham's life. So in our comparison of life, there's a race we need to be sure that as we cross the finish line, we're winning. I've told this story before, but I'm going to finish up with it. Pastor Scott has a painting on the west wall of his office. And it's called Christ, the Light of the World. And it's a picture of Jesus in a white robe, a crown of thorns on his head. He's holding a lantern, and he's knocking on a door. Of course, the inspiration for this painting was Revelation 3.20. And I'll just read it. And this is what Jesus said. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So, so after this, the artist, whose, whose name was Hunt, he painted this around 1850, he was from Great Britain. He had a showing for this painting. And some art critic criticized him because he said the door has no handle on the outside. And the artist responded that there had been no mistake because the handle is on the inside of the door. We have to open the door and let Jesus into our heart. We can then be sure that as we cross the finish line, we win. We can be sure that the eternity that follows our death will be one of comfort. Let us pray. Our Father, we're thankful this morning that you warn us, you tell us the truth again and again and again. Lord, in our culture, there's just a lot of people that don't want to hear it. They want to have their good now with a devastating future to come. God, we don't rejoice in that. It's heartbreaking. But we're also thankful that through Jesus, no matter what we go through in this life, no matter the pain or the struggle or the despair, that comes to an end. And the future for those of us who believe is glorious. We have every reason for hope. Lord, for that we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.